Let's introduce depression as a topic first. Depression. Major depression, mild depression, major depressive disorder. This covers a lot of different concepts, and it means a lot of different things to different people. And I'll, I'll define what I mean by that um, briefly before we start. I will point out that the papers to discuss are on Moodle. There's a list of papers, and you've been separated into groups for the discussions. So you have lab groups already, and you have different groups for the discussions. And the two papers we're going to look at next Tuesday are these two papers that are a little older now, but they are pretty good at creating a nice comprehensive picture. The first of which is a, a very nice um, dose response. Exercise impacts depressive symptoms. How much do you need? How frequent is there a recipe for exercise and depression? That's what the first paper looks at. The second paper looks at is it likely that whatever the recipe is, the effects persist? How long can you expect exercise to be a therapy for major depressive disorder? We're trying to paint a picture here of does exercise play a role or can it help regulate or be used to treat depression as a, uh, a disorder or a disease? And then how effective is it? That's what I want to get out of these last two or three sections. Can exercise impact the disease? How would you use it? And then how effective is it? That's what I want to, uh, to focus on. So there are two groups. There is um, group one and group two. Let's say group one does done 2005. Group two does uh, Babiak 2000. Not even odd, that's from an old these are slides from an old class when I, when I did have even and odd groups. I had more than two groups. Group 1 does done 2005. Group 2 does Babiak 2000. And it is listed that way on the schedule on Moodle. So make that small change. The way the class is going to go on Tuesday next week is that you will have read these before coming. When you get here, you get together with peers in your groups. All the people that have read the paper sit together. So there are one group of five, one group of six. So you've got a small-ish group. And you will discuss and review the assigned paper. So you sit with your peers, and it's a chance to say, OK, well, I found this really interesting. Or I didn't understand this part. And you come together with a consensus. Your group figures out the paper and makes sure that everyone is on the same page. This used to be more impactful when we would send one person out to do the, uh, the discussion afterwards. But the way that it works, because there's 11 people in the class, which is a prime number and not easy to make into a mul uh, multiple small groups. After you have a review with peers in the same paper group, we're going to split out. Uh, we're going to mix the groups up. And then each half of this new group with a different paper background, is going to be able to lead the, the other students through their paper. So the idea here is you need to be able to understand your topic really well, and you have a chance to solidify that understanding initially. Then you become the champions of your paper. Now with that understanding, you're leading people through that have not seen the results at all. So you're not supposed to read both papers. Your job is to read one paper, know it really well, and then be able to disseminate that information. Be able to translate that information to people that have a modest background in the area, but that aren't experts on the topic. We are starting a new style of uh, learning. Learning and disseminating. So you're going to do that. There are two 15-minute periods where um, group one does their paper, and then we switch roles. Group two does their paper. By the end of it, everyone should know both papers, and we come back together and do a brief class discussion. Summarize the main figure, the main findings. Take a couple um, take-home messages or, or take-home points that um, I'll summarize for you in a nice page that we can 
study for the exam. Now the way that these are marked is slightly different. Everyone is doing a uh, summary every week. Everyone reads one paper and then everyone completes a summary sheet. Summary sheet is on Moodle. It asks you a couple questions about the paper. Summarize it in one sentence. What's the main gap? How are they studying that gap? What's an important finding? The basic summary of the paper. And the peer evaluation sheets are uh, also on Moodle. They're slightly different. Let me show you with pictures how this is going to work out. We have group one and group two. There are 11 students in the class. And so just focus on the left hand side for now. This is you coming in and getting to, together with your peers to solidify your understanding of the paper. Everyone talks about their paper for 15 minutes. You all get it, which is great. And then we mix the groups up. Half of the individuals move into one group, half move into the other. At this point, we have 15 minutes where um, group one's individuals will lead a discussion. And it's sort of a panel discussion. It's not perfect. I'd like for one person to do this, but it's not possible because we have an odd prime number of individuals. So this will be a small panel-led discussion. All three individuals here that have read the same paper will explain that paper. And they can each fill in the gaps where someone might have missed something. They can come up with their own ideas. But the idea is it's a team-delivered uh, consensus or a team delivered message and in that team in doing that as a team you will be evaluated by the other people that are receiving that information so the peer evaluation sheets if a B and C read a B and C are giving you information on their paper person D green D in this group will have one peer evaluation sheet for all three so the average peer evaluation sheet um, for all three people is what person D hands in. Green E will also hand in a peer evaluation sheet. So I get two evaluation sheets for all three individuals, the average of the individuals. So not one of them will be able to sway the mark too far one way or the other. It's used to enhance the summary sheet that you give to me. But it, how well did this small team do at explaining their paper. So it's tricky. It's not, we'll see how it goes. We'll leave it at that for now. Does that make sense though? Those pages are online. Print them before class if you can. And what I will do, maybe I'll print a couple and bring them with me in case anybody forgets them. How about that? Your summary sheets should be printed first because you'll need them to hand in that day before you leave. Summary sheets are often good to figure out as you're going through the paper. Make sure you bring your summary sheet with you filled out. You don't want to be spending time filling it out in class. Maybe you have a couple blanks that you need to get your peers opinion on and you can do that in the 15 minutes, but you don't want to spend the entire time trying to read through and fill out the summary sheet when you get here. Okay. Questions about that exercise? None so far? Okay. So that's next Tuesday, a week from today. All right, let's talk about depression. And in this section, when I say depression, it's not general malaise, it's not uh, feeling lethargic. It's not being disappointed. It's not feeling kind of glum. What I'm referring to here is major depressive disorder, MDD, major depressive or, or clinical depression. While I'm talking about that, it's important to understand that depression, like the other chronic diseases we've talked about, is also a spectrum. Small feelings of discomfort or sadness can snowball and become larger feelings and left untreated they can become major depressive disorder so it is a spectrum the work that we are discussing is related specifically to major depressive disorder and it's not immediately clear 
if the therapeutic benefits will translate to different spots along the spectrum. It's likely, but I'm not going to say they will because the focus is major depressive disorder. That said, you can have uh, a dysphoric mood state, uh, sadness that might persist for a few days, but we'll talk about what it means to have major depressive disorder and why that's different from simply feeling overwhelmed or simply feeling anxious. And that in itself brings up a point that anxiety and depression are often talked about under the same umbrella or in the same breath, but they should be separated. They are different clinical uh, conditions or states. That said, I'll often talk about anxiety and depression usually in the same breath. I, I shouldn't. I'm trying not to. They are distinct and different. And if I do, it's not on purpose. It's mostly just because maybe it's a habit, for instance. I'm not sure. So a spectrum disorder ranging from uh, sadness, temporary transient sadness, to a dysphoric mood that persists for a few days, to major depressive disorder where nearly every day is spent um, perhaps with suicidal thoughts or uh, general apathy, not wanting to engage in society and withdraw. Major depressive disorder is different from a dysphoric mood state or general sadness. Okay, it's also um, difficult to study in and of itself. Depression does occur by itself, obviously, but the causes are often rooted in something else. It can be the result of um, some change in a personal situation, work life that is suboptimal, or a uh, change in personal relationships, um, acute breakups, for instance, or something severe that's happened to a family member or to a close friend. And this is... Um, this is under the same umbrella. It's something that can develop into the major depressive disorder that we're talking about, but it's not necessarily the same thing. So it's difficult to study on its own in and of itself because these other things happen at the same time. It could be there's a disease or disorder that I've had that I've sought treatment for, but my therapy isn't going as well as I thought it would. And so now I'm feeling low feelings, low mood because of that, and my progress isn't as, as good as I would have hoped for. Is the effect of exercise on depression in that case going to be because exercise impacted depression, or is it because exercise impacted whatever my therapy was at that point in time? It's difficult to separate the two. But where I can, I'm going to separate the two and focus only on depression, because that's the focus or, or that's intended to be the focus of this section. It's sort of artificial though, and I get that, because real life doesn't often separate these two conditions out. But with that in mind, let's see if we can understand what exercise might do in, in this exclusive case, and probably in the combined cases as well. Let's first start with trying to identify what major depression is. If we identify that it's a spectrum, how far along the spectrum do we need to go before we arrive at what's considered major clinical depression? Um, the most recent um, diagnostic manual for depression, the Diagnostic and Statisti uh, Statistical Manual for Depression, is the fifth version, which is what, early 2014, 15? I wonder actually if there's a sixth now. Um, this was the most recent when I put the slides together, at least, and honestly, from four to five, there wasn't much of a change, so I think that these are going to hold up pretty well. Um, the diagnostic manual states that five of the following criteria need to occur over the same two-week period, at least five, representing a change from previous function, a change from previous function. So this is something new that has developed and the criteria that I'm going to list are the things that might have developed. This is um, a clinical spin, this is clinical diagnosis, someone that's trained with the DSN manual would evaluate these. It's not for personal self-diagnosis because we are inherently biased and we wouldn't necessarily do these objectively. 
So at least five of the following symptoms present during the same two-week period that are a change from normal. We need at least one of the two or the following two criteria. It has to be a depressed mood, however that's judged, most of the day, nearly every day over the course of a two-week period. And so there's some flexibility in how these are interpreted and if we are trying to self-evaluate during a situation of a depressed mood, it may seem like it's most of the day, nearly every day, when it might not be objectively. So it's difficult to self-diagnose. This needs to be a professional um, that, that's trained the DSM manual. It has to be either depressed mood almost all the time, or now a change where there's diminished interest uh, or pleasure in all or most activities that used to bring uh, pleasure or enjoyment. So it is an active change, a diminished interest or pleasure in activities that used to bring enjoyment. So these are changes from a previous function where there wasn't a depressed mood most of the time or activities were enjoyable. Now that is different over the course of a two-week period. At least one of these things has to uh, persist. The other three to four can be taken from any of the following. Some significant change in weight or appetite. Might be um, an external um, manifestation of depression, for instance. Insomnia or hypersomnia. How depression manifests is different than anyone. It could be that they generally um, stick to the couch and won't do anything but nap, or are always awake. Psychomotor agitation, um, really quick agitation, fast movement, twitches, um, and, and nervousness, or complete general mellowing and relaxation. Not mellow in the, in the good relaxed sense, but just inability to move around. Um, retarded psychomotor activity, which plays into fatigue or loss of energy, which is again something that's somewhat difficult to categorize, but general feelings of malaise and not being able to get off the couch, fatigue, not being able to motivate yourself to go out for a walk or do normal chores, things that would normally um, be part of your daily routine. Those often will translate or, or um, feed into feelings of worthlessness or guilt. Not only do these feelings persist in depression, but then there's judgment associated with feelings like this. If you are all of a sudden gaining weight or all of a sudden unable to sleep, you feel like it shouldn't be the case. You want your reality to be different from what it is. And so it's easy to judge yourself when the reality isn't the same as what you would expect. And if you're unable to change it, you feel as though you failed somehow in being able to live your life normally. So you feel worthless or feelings of guilt. Or maybe you simply try to repress feelings like that. Diminished ability to think at all because you're trying not to think about it because thinking about anything, maybe it's the situation or the disease or friend or family member or whatever caused you to be in this situation in the first place, maybe it is painful. And so you avoid thinking about it. And then ultimately, if it's severe enough, these feelings can um, culminate in feelings of self-harm or death or suicide. So these can be very severe. All of these things should be um, uh, considered considered actively, considered seriously, and taken with caution. Um, these are all things that would be evaluated by a clinical professional, hopefully as the, uh, the person in this situation would seek help. These are clinical assessments of ma major depressive disorder. One of the first two plus any five of the following, if these persist for two weeks or are present at the same time over the same two week period, that's what we would consider as major depressive disorder. So this is a severe situation. It's not just transient stress, not low mood. This is a very severe situation. Maybe some of these are even familiar. Some of these are familiar to me, and that's okay and that's normal. 
but the combination, the culmination of all of these together is what we're talking about. And, and I'm hoping that's not normal or familiar. And if it is, then that's something that I think should be acted on. But I'm not the, the professional to be able to do that. So this is framing the landscape. This is framing major depressive disorder. This should give you a sense of what we're talking about. And now this is what we're hoping exercise can help treat. Exercise certainly won't be the only treatment. We're looking to see if exercise can be impactful in any of these arenas. To complement the clinical diagnosis, a lot of the studies that we're looking at don't go this in-depth. There's a lot of flexibility, for lack of a better word, in interpreting some of these criteria. What's fatigue or loss of energy? How severe does agitation have to be to qualify as an item on the slide? It's difficult in some cases to check the box and say yes or no. So a lot of the um, self-administered questionnaires or the questionnaires that we'll see reported in um, the studies that we're looking at are like this one. This is the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression, the HRSD, or the HAMD. Um, this is validated against the DSM manual. So by collecting responses to these questions, more often than not, I think it's 80% of the time, there's agreement between scores on this questionnaire and the DSM clinical evaluation of major depressive disorder. It's not clinical, um, but it's a step in the right direction. It gives you a good idea if there might be something underlying that needs to be investigated. Um, this is the Hamilton rating scale. There is the, there's a number of different questionnaires. We're going to look at the Beck depression inventory on the next slide. There's the general well-being scale, uh, the CESD, the Center for Epidemiological Studies scale of depression is one that we'll talk about in a, in a study or two. Um, they all generally do the same thing. So the Hamilton rating scale has a number of questions and you answer based on how appropriate or how severe that, that feeling is. So depressed mood, do you have a depressed mood? Is it absent, there's no depressed mood? Or um, do you report virtually only feelings of depressed mood? Questions like this then will get added up, and there's some score at the end. The Hamilton rating scale typically has 17 questions. Some of them have 21. A score over 8. A score over 8 on a 17-point question um, qualifies you as having major depressive disorder. A score um, over 8 is on a 17-point scale. So going through 17 questions, on a 17 question scale, score over eight on a 17 question scale would be cause for concern. So questionnaires are laid out like this or the Beck depression inventory um, for comparison has something somewhat similar but there isn't a feeling that is the subject of the question. Instead, um, you're asked to go through each question to find the statement that is most appropriate. I do not feel sad. I feel sad. I am sad all the time. I am so sad and unhappy I can't stand it. And you mark your answer down. You score each question appropriately. And then at the end, you um, add all the questions up. And then it categorizes the individual generally as being somewhere on the spectrum of depression. Moderate depression, severe, extreme Notice it's not clinical, so it's not diagnosing major depressive disorder. It's telling you where you might be on the spectrum and um, whether more professional opinion or help should be sought, perhaps. But the Beck Depression Inventory has a similar um, setup to the Hamilton Rating Scale. 21 questions in this case added up to a score at the end that puts you in one of these bins, for instance. And so for the longest time, these were the questionnaires that um, were used in research, and we'll see them uh, referenced a lot. But I think it's, it's um, really interesting to see 
um, this area turn the corner and now with the, the prevalence of smartphones and um, a lot of app related questionnaires things are translating to the digital age so to speak this was um, this was one advertised um, to the university a couple years ago I think it, it started as like a faculty initiative and then it was broadcast to students as well and there's a number of things like this that help to track uh, mood over time and ask you just at, uh, at different random points in time to get a, an unbiased objective sense of your mood during the day. Um, it was made by German psychologists based on the uh, international um, uh, Center for Disease, International Center for Disease. They have a depression scoring system as well, similar to the HAMD, similar to the DSM manual, but the German version. Um, and it's, um, it's um, I guess, it's rigorously <laughs> vetted against the, uh, the clinical evaluation of depression. And after a 14-day period, remember we talked about two weeks, all day, every day, do these feelings persist? Do they persist at the same time over a two-week period? This is one of the... Um, the types of apps now that can be used sort of as a, um, a memory extension, if you will. It's kind of interesting to think about it because whenever you do a questionnaire like the HAMD or the CESD, it's retrospective, right? It's at one point in time where you're trying to remember all the times that you felt a certain way. And a lot of the time, the feelings of sadness, for instance, are pretty profound and maybe they seem to take up more space in your daily life than, than they actually do. So something like this that's on a device that you always have with you that can pull you any time during the day or night can get a much more objective, true picture of um, depressive feelings and symptoms throughout the day. Rather than being a recollection, it's it's a memory extension that allows you to kind of store that point in time to be analyzed later, which is kind of interesting. But then you've got the idea that, well, this is now in a smartphone, and we're starting to realize that even looking at your smartphone can make you dumber. Like having your smartphone in your pocket reduces your ability to perform on an IQ test. Having it within reach is detrimental to your normal cognitive function. So not having it with you forces you to rely on the on your natural abilities. That's really quite paradoxical. So does looking at the questions through a screen change how you would answer them versus writing them on a page? We don't know yet. Pretty interesting step in the right direction though, I think. So that's what we're looking at and these are a couple ways that we can measure depression. Let's take a look at um, the prevalence of depressive symptoms. In the same way that we looked at the other diseases, we're looking at mood disorder at the bottom, which is the equivalent of major depressive disorder in the, um, uh, the StatsCan survey. So mood disorder at the bottom is what we're looking at. Um, these are percentages of the population, again, local, provincial, and national. You'll see a similar trend where locally is higher than provincially and nationally. And unfortunately, women tend to have a higher prevalence or higher rating of mood disorder at all given points in time across all locations and slices of the population than men do. And this phenomenon is consistent across cultures, um, across obviously different regions of the population, local, provincial, national. And it's either, it can be either two things. It's either that women are more depressed or women are more truthful. And men are wrapped up in the idea of depression not being manly and so they'll minimize or downplay their symptoms and not report accordingly. Or there is that disparity where double the percentage of women in Andy Ganesh are depressed compared to men. And that's actually true. So it's impossible to say because things like this are inherently um, subjective. Questionnaires are biased. The uh, reporting is often biased. 
So um, at any given point in time, I think uh, 15 to 20% of people will have had some bout of major depression in their lifetime, and that's not fixed. It's fluid. It changes. And those numbers kind of hold up. We're in that range locally. Um, there's a stepwise progression down, which is slightly less than national average for whatever reason. Um, maybe the, the, the situation living here is, is somewhat more taxing or stressful. Who knows? But we're in that range, 15 to 20%, a little bit lower, um, which is fine. It's somewhat interesting to note, though, that I would probably lump in, there's a couple other um, items here for you to look at for your own interest if you want to. These are perceived health, very good or excellent perceived health, so physical health, very good or excellent mental health, so comparing physical and mental health, and then stress because that often will come into play. Stressful situations will cause feelings that might be misconstrued as, as depression. Um, I find it interesting that these two don't add up though, that if I were to, to consider the picture of mental health, I would probably take in very good or excellent mental health and then those are the mood disorder and those should be the two pieces of the puzzle that you put together, right? Good mental health, bad mental health, and those should go together. But as a mood disorder, this is focused only on major depressive disorder, not the in-betweens. And so there's a lot to kind of be gleaned from what's not being reported on this slide. If, a th uh, what, two-thirds of the population says they are in very good or excellent mental health, and then you've got 10-ish percent of the population with a diagnosed mental disorder, then whoever's left out of that is somewhere in between, possibly. You could argue that's the case. And that in-between percentage, the 20 to 30 percent of individuals in the middle are arguably not more important, but certainly individuals that should be targeted and might benefit from information like this. Maybe they're in between, or maybe they are not reporting. Um, either way, good health or bad mental health. Really odd too that um, we see this this uh, this pattern where women report a, a higher percentage mood disorder, but then we have such a large percent reporting better mental health locally than anywhere else. There's no difference between men and women at the provincial and national level, but just locally, there's a higher percentage with a mood disorder and a higher percentage of women that report very good or excellent mental health. That's I, don't, I, I can't explain that. I just find that striking. It stands out. So regardless, we are focused on a small-ish slice, uh, slice of the population with the potential for the subject of this section to provide some therapy for the individuals in the middle, the individuals that are somewhere between these two uh, reporting values or for individuals in the excellent and very good category that might uh, encounter depression in the future or might be lying. Who knows? Anyone with um, subpar feelings of, of, um, uh, of depression would benefit from, these, um, from this type of work. So let's take a look then at no, let's, let's briefly introduce how depression is uh, rooted physically before we break for right now, because we've covered a lot of information. It's somewhat of a, of a heavy topic, and we want to leave something for Thursday when we come back to discuss. So let's briefly mention, no, you know what? 